I'm going to round off this evening by briefly discussing a case which is a good illustration of the court's approach to some of the issues that have been discussed this evening. Um, that is the case of Ashworth and others in the Royal National Theatre, um, or as it's perhaps inevitably uh, come to be known, the Warhorse case. Now, many of you may be familiar with this case, uh, some of you may not. The claimants were a number of professional musicians who were employed to provide live music during performances of uh, Warhorse. The defendant was the National Theatre. The defendant's uh, creative management team took the decision to move from live music during the performances to recorded music. And on that basis, uh, gave the claimants notice that their employment was going to be terminated on the grounds of redundancy. The claimants uh, sought an interim injunction to prevent that uh, dismissal taking effect. The matter came before uh, Mr. Justice Cranston in the High Court, uh, who applied the ordinary uh, American cyanamid principles for applications such as these, um, whether there's a serious question to be tried, whether there is a real prospect of obtaining a uh, specific performance or a final injunction at trial, adequacy of damages and the balance of convenience. Now, in respect of whether there is a specific, uh, whether is whether there was a serious question to be tried, the uh, claimant's straightforward argument was the contract of employment provided for circumstances where either party could terminate the relationship, and in respect of the defendant, uh, that could be done during a twenty-six week probationary period or where the production was closed. Uh, but it did not provide, the contract did not provide uh, the defendant the right to terminate uh, employment on the basis of a creative decision to dispense with uh, the orchestra. So the claimants, uh, upon receiving their notice uh, letters, affirmed their contracts and turned up for work. Uh, they were turned away, of course, and uh, the defendant's position was uh, that a proper construction of the contract, either the express terms or implied, uh, that they did have a right to terminate in these circumstances. Mr. Justice Cranston held that there was a serious issue to be tried here. Uh, he accepted that the plain words of the contract did not cover what the National Theatre were purporting to do. And it's evident, although this was the interim stage, it's evident from the judgment that in fact, uh, the court felt that the claimants had a strong, strong argument uh, that this was a termination in breach of contract. Nevertheless, uh, interim relief was refused. And it was refused uh, on a number of grounds. Firstly, that uh, the likelihood of obtaining a final injunction uh, at trial were uh, very limited. And that uh, decision was come to uh, for a number of reasons that have already been um, raised that Mark discussed. So first of all, that there had been a loss of confidence in the claimants. Um, this was on the basis that the management team had taken the view that the play was better off without them. Second ground was uh, that it was the court was uh, doubtful as to whether it was truly workable uh, to impose a, an interim injunction. Uh, rehearsals had taken place in respect of the changes and um, to a certain extent playing with recorded music had become embedded. And finally, a rather novel uh, point was that um, it wasn't uh, appropriate to impose an injunction because it would interfere with the defendant's Article 10 rights uh, to freedom of expression. Now, it might be said that all three of those grounds are somewhat problematic. Um, first of all, there was no suggestion that uh, the claimants 
ability or honesty or integrity was being challenged. Uh, the point that they made was that they were professionals, the actors and the cast were professionals, and actually it wouldn't take a great deal of effort to get back to the position that they had been in prior to this change being made. Uh, it's also difficult to see quite why this would be an unjustified interference with the defendant's Article 10 rights, given that essentially the court would be requiring them to abide by a private contract that they had entered into themselves. Perhaps a more persuasive ground for refusing uh, the interim relief was on the basis, as the court found, that damages would be an adequate remedy. Now, this is, of course, at the interim stage. So what was being looked at is uh, any loss that might be suffered between the interim application and the final hearing. Uh, and the court held that damages would be an adequate recompense um, if a final injunction was in fact granted. For completeness uh, and for good measure, the court also found that balance of convenience favoured um, refusing interim relief. So that is, as I say, just a brief uh, reference to this case, because it's useful, I think, in, in, in two areas. It's, a, it's an interesting illustration, firstly, of the discretionary nature of these remedies um, and the fact that there are going to be a whole host of factors that will be taken into account when a court comes to decide whether to grant uh, interim relief or indeed final relief. It's also um, illustrative of the general reluctance of the courts to intervene to keep an employment relationship alive where one party has indicated their intention uh, to bring it to the end, even where there may be strong grounds for arguing that that termination is itself in breach of contract. <clears throat>